pleasure to be here this evening, and uh, thanks so much for having me. My name is Anita Grada. I work with the Austrian Institute of Technology, so I'm working in research. And today I want to talk to you about one of the projects that I'm currently involved in. It's one of many. Last year, maybe some of you remember, I was talking about our big data work. Uh, you can still find the video online if you want, want to re-watch that. It was also about analyzing movement data, the same as today. Uh, but this one, I think, is probably applicable for a wider audience. There's a less steep learning curve involved, so you don't need a Hadoop cluster to do any of those things. Instead, it's something that uh, people, whoever has movement data and uh, wants to get a better understanding about what they can learn from it, should be able to use. So. It's Moving Pandas is the name of the Python library that I started developing. And unfortunately, it has very little to do with those uh, cute little buggers. But instead, I'm talking, of course, about the Python data analysis library Pandas. So before I go any further, how many of you are using Pandas or have at least heard of it? Uh, that's good, at least half, more than half of you. That's awesome. How many of you have already used uh, GeoPandas? Anyone here has used GeoPandas? One, one hand? <laughs> okay, awesome. Uh, so it, it goes in this direction, obviously. But let's start from the beginning. Why do we need libraries that deal with movement data? Movement data is mo getting more and more readily available. So there's a lot of different data sets from people, from goods, from vehicles, from animals. Although I haven't found any, any yet of the panda movement, that would be really exciting. And what you get if you have a reasonably sized movement data set is something that looks like the start of this animation. It's just a big mess. If you plot it on a map, you cannot see anything that's going on. So you have to start and aggregate the data. You have to start finding out, okay, where do the trips start? Where do they end? Uh, you have to start to aggregate the origins and these origins and destinations. Then you can compute flows between them and find out, okay, which are the really important connections in the city? At which time of the day are these connections important? Those things can change either on a daily basis or on a seasonal basis. And all these information uh, is not so readily available with standard tools. And that's why um, for special libraries for movement data are really relevant. The main question is, movement data, how, how do you model that? Of course, on the one hand side, it's geographic information because movement has to happen somewhere. On the other side, it's temporal information because also movement happens in time. So you can either model it as geographies with time sets, or you can model it as time series that have a location. These are the two main approaches that you can follow. And on the right hand side, you can see a simple text file containing movement data. And really, you could put it in either one of these two data structures. So I have done quite a lot of uh, research and I have tried different approaches how you could work with the data. So my personal background is in geographic information sciences. So naturally, I tended towards making maps, trying to understand the spatial distribution and how people move from one place to another. So I looked into GIS system, I looked into spatial databases and how they handle movement data. Then I also looked into how R, all the different movement packages for the R language handle movement data. It's amazing. So many people, I think there's 40 or 50 packages for R that handle movement data. All of them do slightly different things. And then there's this whole field from the computer science side, which is called uh, moving object databases. None of those, as far as I know, are really in a production status, but there is extensions for like Oracle or Postgres, which do provide this possibility to model movement data. And um, they also they have slightly different content. So, GIS, for many people who have heard of the tools before, seems like an obvious choice. GIS is very good at the geographic part of things, so you can easily make a map. But GIS gets really tedious once you have temporal order, and of 
course, movement data only makes sense if you sort it chronologically. And so many of the things that you need to do to handle movement data in a GIS, like writing the SQL statement that you see here on the right, um, it, it's not the shortest one or the most obvious one, and it gets way more complicated if you want to do more complex things like this one, really, it only sorts the positions by time and connects the line. So the really huge problem is that the data models that we have in GIS are focused completely on geography and they ignore time. So you can have either points or segments between consecutive points and you can store time with that. But there is no built-in logic in any GIS that says, okay, these points belong to the same object and should be treated as if they belong to the same object in the analysis. Also, you can, of course, model the whole trip or trajectory as a single line, but then you lose all the temporal information for all the individual points because it just you only have the possibility to store one or two time stamps in the attribute. So that's really not very um, <laughs> attractive for this kind of work. So as I said, in R, there's a lot of libraries. Maybe I just read one, which is called Trajectories. Uh, it's developed by Esther Fredersman from the University of Munich. <coughs> and they have this whole complex uh, data structure here, which basically says uh, R trajectories are points and connections between the points. So that's already a very good understanding. And finally, the moving object databases, the very interesting point I wanted to raise here is um, that they don't just have um, straight connections between consecutive observations, but what the really interesting thing they do is they describe the trajectory between points also as arcs or other kinds of uh, connections. So they come from the computer science side, they really look into how to reduce the data that you need to store, they have very complex analysis. The only problem that I have with them is that there is no way to readily visualize the data. So if you want to do exploratory data analysis, uh, it, it's more complicated to work with these kinds of tools because you cannot get the data out in a way that's really good for interactive exploration. So what kind of explorations do you want to do with movement data? There's a lot of things that you want to do on the individual trajectory, so just looking at one object that is moving at a time. Then there's tons of functions that you can do on groups of uh, trajectories or between different groups. And then there's, of course, a lot of functionality that is just data manipulation, but that is necessary to get uh, where you want to go. So the most obvious things is, for example, spatial primitives. You want to find the location at a certain time or the other way around. You want to find the time given a location, so you want to know at which point in time did that object arrive at this location. Then there are things like distance and uh, speed that you want to calculate. And of course, um, also things like uh, um, uh, velocity, so angular velocity, how quickly something changes direction. <laughs> In the groups of trajectories, there's really, it depends a lot on the application field. So if people track animals, they might want to observe flocking behavior, like which animals uh, form the group at which point in time and where, and when did the flock disperse later on. Or in modeling um, disease uh, outbreaks, you might want to see um, if, depending on how people move in your model, how quickly does a disease spread within your city because people meet in particular places and the likelihood that they transmit the disease to someone else that they meet uh, can influence these immun immunological models. So there's a lot of research going on here as well. And finally, the, the things that you really need under the hood for the library to be useful are things like being able to uh, clip the trajectories to a certain area, of course, to have an area of interest, to have queries, efficient queries that allow you to extract a certain point in time, to find trajectories that are similar to one that you are currently observing, so similarity searches. Um, there's a lot of measures that you can use for similarity, from geometric ones to spatial temporal ones, and also ones that include properties of the moving object, of course. And then you need specific tools for downsampling, reducing data size, and for dealing with coordinate conversions. So 
with with all these background, why did I choose to build this library on top of pandas? If you have worked with pandas, you know those data frames are awesome for exploration, for data analysis, and also pandas have a very good support for time series. So here I'm trying to uh, uh, follow the model of a trajectory being a time series with geographies. So this is one part of the puzzle. The second part of the puzzle is that geopandas already exist. The geopandas makes it possible to put point, line, or polygon geometries into the columns of a data frame. So you can't just check or store numeric and text values and booleans, but you can actually put whole geometry features into your data frame. And this is really useful, of course, to make those time series of either individual points or of lines between consecutive points. So these are the core functions that I have implemented in the trajectory class so far. There's a couple of more already, which you can find on the GitHub repo. Um, of course, I won't go into detail uh, for all of them. Uh, suffice it to say that the essential part is that you can really easily take a text file or an existing GIS data file with the positions, with the timestamps, and convert it into a data uh, into a trajectory object to do your analysis on. And um, I've also prepared a lot of tutorials already, which you can find online. So there's this example that I will step through here uh, to show you the highlights only, which deals with the analysis of ship data. And there's also a second one that deals with the analysis of uh, migrating bird data. So these are very different kind of data sets. The one is just for a small uh, region for the uh, harbor of Gothenburg for one day, this ship data. And you can see here that it's really easy. No, this is not. Um, so on the top, you can see it's a one liner to read the geo data set from the file. And you can already <laughs> with the help of GeoPandas, that's not my library yet, but with the help of GeoPandas, you can already plot uh, the content of the position of the geographic data set uh, into the notebook here. And the there's just a couple of lines that you need to go from here to actually making a meaningful, tra meaningful trajectory out of this data set. So, Really, all you need to do is set uh, stick your data frame into a trajectory manager, and it will create trajectory objects. You need to tell it the ID of the object. So, in the case of ships, it's the MMSI, and there's an optional minimum length. So, in this case, I'm not constructing any trajectories that are shorter than 100 meters. Um, but this is all you need to do uh, to build this kind of trajectories and to visualize them on a map. And what you can see here is different patterns of movement for different types of ships. So already with a few lines of code, you can uh, find out, for example, that the, the green ships, the high speed craft, HSC, are only going to this location in the harbor. And the tankers are going to all those birds up there. And the passenger ships, well, they, they travel all the way here. So that's a start, but of course, this is just the very first step. After that, you need to go into details, do the data cleaning, find out what needs to be done before you can actually do some useful analysis, like uh, calculating travel times between locations. Because you usually, you observe the whole trip <coughs> continuously, and there is no information about a stop at a certain location, so you don't know when a ship left a certain place and went to another one. So one of the things that is interesting is to split these trajectories into individual parts between, between stops. So um, this split and observation gaps function here is one of the ways how to deal with missing observations and also a way how to detect stops where um, the tracking is either turned off or where the speed is at zero for these ships. Uh, and compared to the previous example, where you have these 
Field lines here connecting where ship left the area of observation and re-entered it. You can see this here, now that we split the trajectory, it's much more clean already. Uh, we know exactly where the ship left the area. Um, and we now have, um, instead of the original 77 trajectories, we now have around 300 trips that were extracted from that. And with this kind of information, uh, you have much more questions that you can answer. For example, you can answer the questions of which ships left a certain, uh, or uh, which uh, ships started their trip at a certain point uh, in the harbor. So there is this maritime administration building that we saw uh, that is here, and we might be interested in what kind of ships leave from there and at which point in time. And we can use geographic functions to do that. So really, the trajectory already knows its start location, and we can check if the start location intersects a given area of interest. So you have two more lines of codes that really do something, uh, and you can find out which ships uh, departed from this location and at what time of the day. <coughs> Well, that, that was one example, and the second one is with birds. These birds, they have been observed for many, many years. So, well, the ships that was just data of one day, but from a lot of objects, uh, this is data of fewer objects, but observed for a very long time. So, this is one of the birds that is in there, the one with most of the data, actually. And you can see it travels over large distances and over multiple years, because it migrates all the time from the north of Europe to the uh, red sea here. And one of the things that is very handy to do is, of course, to, to split the whole observation trajectory by year so that you can see for all the in different years the, the patterns that this were followed. And then you can, uh, for example, one thing that I found very interesting and I was curious about is whether they have a very regular pattern of migration. So I picked the uh, first of October. And I visualize the location of the birds on the 1st of October of different years. And you can see how they vary in enormously. One year, the bird's still in Denmark, and the other year, it's already down there in Egypt. So it certainly doesn't have a calendar that is triggering its, its migration pattern. Uh, similarly, you can do it the other way around. As I said, you can ask, at which point in time does an object reach a certain location? So here I specified this area of interest around the Red Sea, and, and I calculated which day the bird reached this area. And also these days, they vary a lot, sometimes in October and sometimes uh, only in December does the bird reach this area. I'm not showing you all the code here, but these notebooks, they are on line and the GitHub repository, there's a link to my binder, so you don't need to install anything. You can just run them in your browser, give it a try. You can even load your own data into it and try it. Uh, I've also created a package uh, on PIP, so it should be easy to install if you want to give it a try. Um, uh, the, the final example here is where within this area of interest in, in the Red Sea, I categorized the trajectories by which side of the Red Sea they are on, either on the eastern coast or on the western coast. And then there's also a couple of birds that don't uh, that fly inland. So they really have very different behavior, which is exciting. Finally, um, if you also like GIS, I don't know if there's any QGIS user in here, but this is where I'm coming from, and it, I would wouldn't be me if I wouldn't try to expose the capabilities of this library also to GIS users, to people who maybe don't want to write code themselves. So really, my motivation is to also include the core functions, the ones that I think are useful for most people, into a plugin that can be used from within QGIS. I've already uh, implemented a couple of the basic ones, like creating the lines, the trajectory lines from individual points, adding information like speed and heading to the point so that you can visualize that. But um, many of the things that I showed you in the notebooks are not currently possible in QGIS. Yeah. So once it will be done, it looks something like this. You have the whole desktop GIS environment that you're probably familiar with if you have ever used any of those tools. 
And the idea is to have Tracheck Tools, as it's currently called, as one of the toolboxes that integrate within QGIS and that allow you, you to combine these uh, algorithms with all the already existing hundreds of algorithms to make hopefully a really powerful tool for everyone to use, even people who are not comfortable with scripting Python. So with that, I thank you for this opportunity and I hope that we can talk later if anyone's interested in trying this out. Thank you. <laughs>